After having discussed nominal and real exchange rates in the previous lecture, we now come to the discussion of the purchasing power parity. Now what is purchasing power parity? Suppose that all the goods that we have in the world were completely freely and costlessly tradable, so there are no barriers whatsoever to trade. Then a rational buyer of a certain good would of course only buy the good where it is cheapest. So if there is a certain homogeneous good that can be freely and costlessly traded all around the world, then a rational buyer would search for the country in which this good is cheapest and buy it only there. Now suppose for the sake of the argument that uh, the good that we are talking about are bicycles and the cheapest producer all over the world uh, would be the Netherlands. Then what would happen in this case is that everybody all over the world would want to buy their bicycle in the Netherlands and this would lead to an upward pressure on the price of bikes in the Netherlands of course because there is so much demand from everywhere in the world and at the same time there would be a lot of inflow in terms of currency to the Netherlands and this would put upward pressure on the nominal exchange rate in this case of the whole euro because Netherlands is a part of the euro area. And of course the opposite would hold true uh, for the countries that produce more expensive versions of this uh, good. So if there is another country, say uh, Canada, and they would only be able to uh, produce bikes um, that are much more expensive, then there would be no demand for these bikes and the price would fall. And if there is a lot of uh, trade in this particular good, also the currency of uh, Canada would fall. And this would make uh, bikes produced in Canada much cheaper at the global level. And at the same time, the bikes in the Netherlands, they would become more expensive all over the world. And as one can easily imagine, according to such a no arbitrage argument, so that the uh, buyers are rational and only buy the cheapest good, one would expect in the end that bikes would cost the same in all countries if they were bought from all countries, right? And in this case, the real exchange rate would then be equal to one. So that would be that bikes cost the same all over the world, and this would be the law of one price. Now, obviously, in reality, we know that this is not the case. So there are goods that are much cheaper in one country, much more expensive uh, in others, and still they are bought uh, in both countries and produced in both countries. And we also can recall uh, the picture that we had in the chapter on real exchange rates of the US multilateral exchange rate index in real terms. And we saw back then uh, that this fluctuated quite a lot. And if it was, uh, if the law of one price uh, holds all over the world, then this would not fluctuate, but be a flat line at 100. And we would not have exchange rate movements. So why does purchasing power parity fail uh, typically? And the main reasons are uh, displayed here on this slide. The first one is that of course, not all goods are traded at all. So for example, there is a large share, particularly of services that cannot be traded at all. So a haircut can uh, not be traded. So if there is a hairdresser uh, in New York, then uh, it's very difficult to sell your service to somebody who is located in Sydney. And there are many such services, particularly personal services that cannot be traded at all. But even for goods that can be traded, there are barriers to trade, such as tariffs, quotas, and so on and they impede free movement of the goods. And so also this could lead to uh, a situation where price differences of the goods are sustainable across countries. Then there are usually transport costs. So if goods are shipped, for example, from China to Europe or to the United States, then you have to pay a shipping company, uh, the wages of the people working there, um, putting the goods on a ship, uh, the fuel for the ship, then uh, fees for the uh, using the Suez Canal, for example. Uh, and this is usually just a small fraction of the price uh, of the goods. But in case of some bulky goods, this can become more substantial. Or if certain goods uh, spoil easily, 
then uh, sometimes it's uh, they can only be uh, transported by a plane and this is of course again much more expensive and these transport costs are another reason for why goods are not completely uh, costlessly uh, traded then prices are not fully flexible in the short run. So even if you have rational buyers that may want to switch um, their suppliers because they are too expensive, contracts may sometimes forbid them uh, to switch. The uh, suppliers themselves may not be able to change the price on short notice due to price adjustment costs and so on and other contracts. And uh, this also may lead to a departure of uh, the rule of one price. And finally, the quality of the same good also often differs across countries. So there are some countries that produce, um, say, uh, uh, cars that are uh, known to be of very high quality and other countries that may produce cars that are not known to be of a very high quality. And then even if these cars are cheaper in real terms, people may still prefer to buy this good in the country where it is known that uh, cars are of a higher quality. So all this means that purchasing power will differ across countries and everybody who goes on vacation uh, into foreign countries knows that because if you go there with say $10 or 10 euros then uh, you can buy much much more in a country such as Nepal than in a country such as Switzerland for example. So there are departures from purchasing power parity and the question is how can we measure these departures? And one nice idea stems from the magazine The Economist and they in 1986 started using one particularly homogeneous good across uh, countries, the Big Mac, that is also available in uh, quite a lot of countries and um, uh, compared its real price across the different countries. The idea behind this so-called Big Mac index is that most inputs of Big Macs are non-traded and the costs are therefore um, they accrue locally, such as labor inputs um, in the McDonald's restaurant. So you hire people um, typically locally and have to pay the local going wage rate. The rent that you have to pay, that's set uh, according to local circumstances. And even the ingredients are typically bought locally. Then you can observe the price of the Big Mac in the local currency and calculate its price in US dollars according to the bilateral exchange rate. And if purchasing power parity held true, then this Big Mac should actually cost the same in all countries. Then purchasing power parity would be fulfilled. If the price of a Big Mac is then, however, higher in an economy and lower in another one, then this is basically a deviation from the purchasing power parity and the currency where, uh, of the country where the Big Mac is more expensive would be overvalued in real terms and the currency of the country where it is quite cheap could be undervalued or would be undervalued in real terms. How does this look like across countries? So here we have this price of a Big Mac in US dollars in the year 2022. And what we see is if we take the United States as a benchmark there, uh, the McDonald's cost uh, $5.35 uh, in 2022. And then say in uh, India, it only cost $2.63. So according to this, the McDonald's would be much cheaper in real terms in India. And the Indian currency, the rupee, would be, um, this would be an indication of an undervaluation of uh, the rupee. By contrast, in Liechtenstein, for example, um, the Big Mac costs $7.75, and this would be an indication that the currency is overvalued, and there is a uh, departure of purchasing power parity uh, upwards in Liechtenstein and downwards in India, as compared to the United States. So this is a very nice idea and the Big Mac index is published by The Economist very frequently and it's really uh, a very a good first uh, view on the, whether a currency is overvalued or uh, undervalued in a certain sense. 
But of course, in practice, you would not want to do this calculation just based on one particular good. What's done in reality to account for um, differences in purchasing power is to calculate the price of a basket of certain goods in different countries and then compare the price of these goods um, over the different countries. And doing this allows to trace the purchasing power across the different countries and also how purchasing power develops in the different countries. And what you find then is that goods tend to be much cheaper in low income countries and much more expensive in high income countries, with the main reason for that being that the wages and labor inputs therefore are much higher in high income countries and much lower in lower income countries. So the main reason for the departure are the non-traded local services that have um, quite a large share of labor inputs. And uh, this labor is cheaper in low income countries and more expensive in high income countries. And that's one of the main reasons for departure of uh, purchasing power parity. Now, of course, if we do international income comparisons in terms of per capita GDP and so on and so forth, these comparisons need to take into account that purchasing power differs across countries. Because if you have an income level of, uh, say, $10 per day in the United States, uh, and you have uh, the same level of income in Nepal, then you can buy uh, qu quite a different uh, uh, amount of uh, goods in the different countries. So in the United States, you can buy much fewer goods with $10 than in uh, Nepal. Of course, in international income comparisons, these differences in purchasing power have to be taken into account. And how this is usually done is that GDP of a country is calculated in the local currency, then that's translated into uh, US dollars according to the nominal exchange rate, and then it's adjusted for purchasing power according to the price of the basket of these goods that are observed globally and the evolution of these prices that are observed globally. And the so adjusted uh, GDP or per capita GDP is then expressed in an artificial currency, the international dollar as it is called usually, or uh, it's purchasing a power parity adjusted GDP per capita or per capita GDP adjusted for purchasing power.